Mm. You see, I'm Harriet Tubman, humanitarian, abolitionist, the first black intelligence female officer for the American Civil War. You see, God has given me a lot, but I just want to take a moment and share my story with you. You see, I was born into slavery, and I escaped. And I was responsible for 13 missions, freeing 70 families. You see, on one of those missions, after I escaped, I thought I'd go back and get my husband, but he just was not cooperating with me. So I said, you stay over there, I'm going over to freedom. And see, it wasn't that easy, though, because, you see, my slave master one day got mad at one of the other slaves and threw a heavy metal and hit me in the head. And because of that, I suffered with epilepsy year after year, and it wouldn't go away. But that didn't stop me, because God had a greater mission and vision for me. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And see, my conversations wasn't with man or my slave owner, but the one who loved me so. And the one who gave me a mission and purpose, it was so intentional because he was to get the glory. And he did. And you see, all the things that God has blessed me with, and it wasn't easy, but it was for his glory. As I was closing out my life and I contracted pneumonia, God allowed me to have vision to establish the first senior citizen a home for African Americans. Even in closing out, God still used me. So in every facet of my life, I was at peace. And I just want to share this song with you, I'm at peace. Just close your eyes and just imagine Harriet Tubman singing this song to her God, her Father, her Lord, and her King. Oh, it'll 
be all over in the morning. My Lord, my King, he saved my soul. And now, yes, he picked me up and made me whole. And now, I can see the storm has moved. It's moved away. Oh, 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 oh. The storm has moved. And turn me around And now I can see The storm has moved away Hallelujah, hallelujah mm. John chapter 6. Let me spend just a few minutes with you this morning and afternoon. One of, once again, a very familiar passage of scripture that I want to just lift a couple key verses from the storyline to focus attention on it and uh, wrap it around uh, one life lesson I want to bring, I want to share this morning. Chapter 6. Uh, the, the story is found in, the, in verses 1 through uh, 13. Um, and you know it very well. It's the feeding of the 5,000. But uh, uh, two verses I want us to read together are verses 9 and, verse, verses nine and 13 from chapter 6. So uh, locate that chapter, put, a, put your finger on 9 and 13, and we'll get this up on the screen in the King James translation. And then let's spend a little time as family in the Word, if it's okay. If you got that in your Bibles, would you say amen? amen? If you don't mind, let's just stand together and read those, just those two verses, and then we'll spend some time in the story. As we stand together, read from the King James translation on the screen. It says, let's read, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But of what are they among so many? And in verse 13, 
Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. As you take your seats. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. If you will, let's spend a little time around the subject matter from lack to leftovers. From lack to leftovers. Um, I hesitated to even walk through. I've, we preached on this before, and it's amazing how when you spend time in uh, it's amazing how when you spend time in, uh, in a scripture that you've probably read hundreds of times and you think you know everything there is to know about a, a storyline, it's amazing to me how when you come back at it with a fresh set of, of eyes, uh, God always shows you something new and fresh in the storyline. Anybody know about that but me? I always seem to discover something new that God wants to share in the process of sharing the storyline. And, and there were a couple of things that jumped off the page that I'll share as we come down to this. But you, you know the story. The crowd is, the, the storyline opens up. Let me, let me just read you these in the Amplified, these opening verses that leads down the nine, just so you get this flavor. Amplified says, after this, Jesus went to the farther side of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd was following him because he because they had seen the signs of miracles which he was continually performed upon those who were sick. And Jesus walked up the mountain side and sat down there with his disciples. And now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was approaching. Jesus looked up then and seeing that a vast multitude was coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that all these people may eat? But he said this to prove, to test, to test him, for, he, for Jesus knew well what he was about to do. Philip answered him, 200 pennies, or and Amplified says, or $40 uh, worth of bread. It's not enough that everyone may receive even a little. I think that was somewhere in the range of a couple months' wages, I think someone said. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a little boy here who has with him five barley loaves, you know, the poor man's bread, and two small fish, a couple of sardines. A am I in that Greek? I I'm in that Greek. But what are they among so many people, the 500 men plus women and children, not counted? Uh, so let's call it roughly between 15 and 20,000 people up on the mountain. Uh, let me give you this one life lesson. And then we'll just spend a little time there, if you don't mind, because I want to ask some questions. When you trust God's word and faithfully follow God's plan, you will see God's supernatural blessings, and you will experience God's loving and grace-filled hand. Watch how God unpacks the question inside of the minds of the disciple and then invites us to pull up a seat beside them as they are now facing what looks like a dilemma to them beyond their ability to handle or address it and walks them through the process of preparation as he exposes in them the areas where there's a need. Because in the process of Jesus asking Philip and asking uh, Andrew, uh, the question, well, why don't you just go down, the one other writer said, what do you have uh, that can feed these people? This writer says, the, the wording is, why don't, you, why don't you go down and buy food for these people? Testing Philip. Because the word says he already knew what he was about to do. So this is a, this is a preparation test. This, this, is a, this is a conversation in which Jesus is, is is probing so that he can, he can expose to the listener the need and then bring them to the point of the solution. Um, and the answer that comes back to them is an answer that is crowded and couched in a mentality of lack. 
Am I close? Jesus says, why don't you? In, 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 in the question. In the question lies the answer. Why, why don't you go down and, and buy food for these people? Now, that would be, uh, that would be a question that, uh, that, that has no answer if it's depending upon my, your ability and mine and Philip's ability and Andrew's. Because they begin to do what we do in our flesh. T talk to me if I'm in the same house. They do what we do. We, we, begin to look, we begin to look at our issues and look at our problems and, and look at our circumstances and, and even look at our obstacles and opportunities and immediately the flesh come, brings to the formula, well, now you know that you can't do that. And because we have this sin nature that wells up in a fear tendency, the reality, our, our mental reality and our emotional reality is that when we face what, what looks like an obstacle in life, that has been, that, that, that opportunity, let me put it like, when we face an opportunity that is clearly surrounded in the face of an obstacle, it looks, it looks like an obstacle, but God is turning it into an opportunity, then our tendency is to shrink away or to find excuses or to or indicate that there's no way we can do what you're asking us to do. We operate in our carnality in a spirit of lack, a fear of failing, a fear of being, uh, uh, of being exposed for our weakness. Somehow, uh, so, so, somehow we, 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 we don't want to take the chance. We don't want to step into what looks like an opportunity uh, clearly shrouded as an obstacle because we, we think that somehow, somehow failure is worse than taking a step of risking. A am I getting close? But I love how Jesus loves them. He tells us, he, he asked Philip the question so that he could test him. Now, if he's asking the question as if there is a solution and the solution does not lie inside of me, then the solution must clearly lie inside of him. Am, am I getting there? Talk to me, somebody. If God says to you, I need you to do this thing for the kingdom, and immediately your flesh Immediately, you go into analytical mode. You say, well, now, wait a minute. That, I'm, I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the ass that you're making of me, God. And I'm thinking, now, I don't have, I look back over my history, and I think, now, I don't have any experience in that. What do I know about feeding 5,000 folk? Lord, that's not, that's not my experience. Matter of fact, I don't have the skill set to do that. Uh, as I look back over my journey, nothing, nothing in me has ever rise, risen to the level of reading that large of a task, and yet you're asking me to do that. I don't know anybody that has that kind of influence that I can turn to in order to maintain, maintain the quest, to answer the question that you're asking me, Lord. So it's not inside of me. It's not in my circle of influence. It's not in my historical makeup. So nothing inside of me is telling me that I can succeed at the question that you're asking me. And so I begin, so immediately my response to you, Lord, is that, oh, wait a minute, Lord, you know, my mere talents aren't hardly enough to handle the question that you're asking. What is, what is these few pennies we have in the bank when it comes to such large of an obstacle like 5,000 men plus women and children? And, and, and then if there's anything that I can reach back and grab hold of, I join it with, with Andrew in the question. When he says, well, Jesus says, well, now what can you have? What do you have? What do you have? I've given you the, I've given you the opportunity. You think it's an obstacle. Tell me what you have. Anybody walking with me? Track, track with him. And so God immediately turns to you as, you as you get, as you're faced with the opportunity and you think it's an obstacle and you start pulling out all of your 500 excuses that you can, for reasons that you can't possibly step into that opportunity. And God has the audacity, the, the Holy Spirit has the audacity to prompt you and say, son, daughter, what, what do you have? What's, what do you think is available to you? What, what, what do you bring to the table? And it's not as if you're bringing it to the table or by yourself. He's asking you the question, what do you recognize that God has already done in your life to bring you to this point? Uh, you, you're looking back through your, analyzing your walk of faith, 
analyzing your journey, you're noting all the times you've fallen down and you've made mistakes. You noted a few times that you got up and you, and you had some success in your life, but yet and still your vision is still so narrow that you can't possibly see that God can expand your vision and it's prepared you for this moment. Talk to me, somebody. Uh, I've only got one life lesson. I just need to wrap around this thing. I need to wrap around this thing. And she wants them to understand. And he wants us to understand that when God opens the door, when God presents before you an opportunity, and he asks you the question, are you ready to step into this? That the test is not to, not to pull you down. The test is to prepare you to step up to the next level that God has for you. Can I get any kind of amen in this house? Because he knows that our fear tendency is to operate in a thinking, in a mentality of lack. And even when you've been blessed, <laughs> the tendency is to try to hold, the flesh's tendency is to try to hold on to and hoard it as if, as if, if I give any of this away, uh, y'all gonna, y'all not gonna, y'all gonna really stay here longer. If I give any of this away, then somehow I may find myself someday back into that position that I was in when I didn't have nothing. You know, when the cupboards were absolutely bare. When I couldn't even reach up there and grab a can of, of tuna fish off the shelf, feed myself. I'm looking for crackers and sardines in order to get, in order to get a little something to snack on. Back in the day when the clothes might have been a little bit tattered and, I, and, and the shoes in there had the heels were all worn over. Back in the day when they might not have been but a couple of pair of shoes in the closet and I couldn't dress up to go do a job interview. Back in the day when it felt like that, you know, the, the, the roof might have been leaking and the wind might have been coming through the window sills and the temperature dropped down and we just huddled in there and shuttled around some blankets. Back in the day when it felt like you didn't have much of anything and now that you got a little something that you can wrap yourself around with. You can dress a little more better. You can live in a larger house. And now you worry about holding on to the stuff that you have. Like if I just give any of this stuff away, I may find myself back in the area, in the arena of lack. Andrew says, I found this kid over here who probably has his family's lunch. Five poor folks' piece of bread, barley loaves, thin wafers, couple of sardines, salted, more like relish stuff. And he looks up at Jesus and says, what, what is that? among so many. And Jesus does this. This is one of the things, I got, I, one of my little nuances, Brother Deacon, that I picked up in here. It's amazing how two words can, can impact you so much. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the text says that Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks. demonstrating two things, if you don't mind me staying here just for a second, demonstrating two things. Demonstrating, first of all, that he is very man, and he's thinking, and all, that he's, all that's about to happen uh, is in relationship to God the Father. But secondly, giving an indication that he is very God, and what he's about to do is a glimpse of who he is and his whole power. And so the text says, <laughs> the text says, he took the bread, stay with me, Deacon. It says, he took the bread, the poor folks' barley loaves, and he broke it. The tense used is that it was an instantaneous and one-time event. 
he, he, I'm like, like this, is, this is what happened. He, he broke the bread. But then it says, he gave it to the disciples. Why are you, why you staying here, Pastor? Because the tense that was used when he said he gave is a present continuous tense. Now, sometimes when I think about the storyline, I think about them walking out with, with baskets, and as they're kind of handling it out, uh, maybe the fish and the loaves are, are being, somehow being replenished inside the basket. But there's something about that that makes me think that when he took the baskets and he broke the loaves and he handed out the loaves and the fish, that it was, that it was continuously being multiplied from his hand to the basket. That's a different thing. That's a different thing, family. I mean, whoo. When you find yourself facing situations where you begin to feel the spirit of lack trying to overwhelm you, my Bible says, and Jesus and the Lord asked you the question, uh, what do you have? You, you don't think you're large enough for this task? Tell me what you have. In other words, what have I already built into you? What, what have I already prepared in and through you? How have I already positioned you for this blessing? Because God isn't sending you to the opportunity unless he's prepared you for the blessing. Can I talk to somebody? God, help me, help me, help me out. Am I by myself? He doesn't ask them the question so that they can fail. He asks them the question so that they can see him move in the process of succeeding in the kingdom. In the question is the hope and assurance that there is an answer. So now I have to, I, it makes me just want to continue to adjust my vision upward for the Lord. It makes me want to just adjust my vision upward for the Lord. So when he puts that opportunity in front of me, and immediately, I begin to want to shrink away from that. It's like, oh, Lord. Then I have to, then, then the spirit inside of me nudges me. I have, to adjust to the, I have to adjust to where God is and say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know that I don't, I know that in and of myself, I don't have anything I bring to the table that can accomplish or succeed at this task. But it cannot, it must not be about me. It must be greater than my pay grade. And therefore, He's just telling me to take this step of faith. Bring what he's already poured inside of me. Bring the preparation that he's already made through me. Bring how he's already positioned me for the task. And trust that God says, when you just hand over the basket, hand over them few little, hand over them few little pieces of bread and those two sardines you got, and just give it to the Lord. And then watch and when he puts his hand on you and the opportunity, how he will multiply it, how he will break it, and how he will, he will multiply and make that thing happen so that it just becomes more than you can possibly. He broke the bread. And I kind of have, I kind of have vision. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here visualizing in my mind how he's, how he's breaking these two little sardines. I mean, uh, does that make sense? You, you got to step on the scene. Poor folks' bread. And as he puts it in the basket, the basket's full. Poor folks' sardines, you know. Like, he looking at 12 baskets, and then it's full. And then orders them and then involves them in the process. He says, you don't think you can be involved, then you need to be involved in the process because this is the preparation. This is how you grow in faith. He didn't, he didn't need them in the process. The very fact that he was expanding the bread, uh, you know, multiplying the bread and multiplying the fish indicates he certainly has a divine distribu distribution network. He can get it to the people. Yeah? Wasn't that he needed them. This was for them. And so as he walks them through this thing here, and he blesses them in this process, the text, the text goes on to tell us, let me flip it on down here a little bit further, that people sat down on the ground, divided them into, 
into manageable lots. The Lord is, God is not a God of confusion. Just, just jot that down on your notes somewhere there. He, he, he's a God of order. Distributes it out through the disciples as people are reclining. And the text tells me in verse 12, when they all had enough. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let me pick up verse 11. It says, he took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, distributed to disciples. So also with the small fish, as much as they wanted. Don't, don't miss that. As much as they wanted. I mean, just, just keep on dining on the divine blessing of the Lord. As much as you can handle. He just said, keep on eating. You know, <laughs> keep, keep, keep on eating, because it's, it's, it's God's supply is... It's not exhaustible. Talk to me, Professor. Am I getting close to this thing here? I'm just, I'm trying to move through it kind of quick, but it's too rich. It's too rich for me. It's way too rich for me. Then when they had, when they had enough, he said to the disciples, now gather up the fragments and the broken pieces that are left over because of God. indeed God is not a God of waste so that nothing may be lost or wasted. And the text says, accordingly, they gathered up and they filled 12 hand baskets with fragments left over by those who had eaten from the five barley loaves. He has now moved their mindset from a system of lack, and he's now training them for, to, to become a mindset of abundance, dealing with what God, with leftover abundance. God's, I, I, I like to call it God's blowback blessings. Huh? That, 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 that's my term for it. It's, it, it's, it's, it's serving God Stepping out of your mindset of lack into God's uh, uh, abundance and, and wide vision for kingdom impact and watching how God moves in and through you and utilize, has the audacity to use us in the process. He lets us walk along the process and, and be a part of it as he's preparing us for even greater things that he wants to accomplish in and through us as we touch lives for Christ, sharing the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Start telling folk how we, when you walk in faith, how God is able to not only provide for you, but protect you, give you peace, and give you prosperity, kingdom prosperity, in the midst of that walk there, letting us know that nothing is too hard for our God. And he who called himself the bread of life is now modeling this thing right in front of everybody so that they can see this and blessing beyond anybody to the, to the point that you now have leftovers that were larger than your original offering. Don't miss this. If you're worrying about giving, and it's not just monetary, but let's, if you're worrying about giving of yourself and giving of your material things and, and giving of your service, uh, th this, is one of those, this is one of those principles of reciprocity. God always blesses larger than you can possibly give. You, you can't outgive him. You can't outgive him. Oh, I, I, wish you, I, I, wish, I wish we all grabbed hold of that and lived in that. Then you would begin to see your life explode with God's goodness and grace operating in your journey. Uh, you would be moving. He'd be moving us from the mindset of lack into the, to the mindset of, how do I now deal with all this open window leftovers <laughs> that God has poured into my life? But, but let me go home with this. Walking them through and preparing them to, to understand that there will be greater uh, opportunities and greater... Uh, greater service provision wasn't just for the moment. Because you'll remember last Sunday we spent some time with them around the campfire. As a resurrected Jesus has now had them cast their net on the right side. After, after uh, frustrating themselves and having not caught any fish. You, you remember the storyline and then pulling in more fish to, than they can possibly get. You see, you see them now dragging. They've gone from, you know, what is this among so many? To coming out of the ocean and dragging a net with 153 fish in it, kinds of fish. To sitting down beside Jesus, if you remember the story, and him breaking the bread. 
and giving them fish and then saying, feed my sheep, Peter. This was a part of the journey of preparation to move their thinking from lack to God's great abundance so that when he now, the resurrected Jesus, is about to leave them, they know that he's able to provide for all of their needs according to his riches and glory. And every time there's a temptation where you face an obstacle and your flesh wants to tell you to back off, you face something that God has placed in front of you to, to make you stronger, and, 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 the, and your flesh says, back off, you, you can't do this. You know you don't come from that kind of DNA, or you didn't live on that side of the tracks, or you didn't come from that kind of educational background, or you don't have that kind of money in your family, or that educational level, you don't have that many degrees going along in your, in your birthright and that kind of thing. When, when everybody on outside of you is trying to tell you you're not good enough to do what God has called you to do, you're not big enough to do what God has called you to do, you're not wealthy enough to do what God has called you to do, you're not famous enough to do what God has called you to do, you're not talented enough to do what God has called you to do. Matter of fact, you don't even look like any of us, so you can't do what God has called you to do. When somebody tries to tell you that you're operating in the, oper in the mindset of lack, you need to step on up here and say, but my God <laughs> is able to take a few small talents and a few small gifts and make them explode and have impact for him. My God is a good God. And he's preparing me for something I cannot handle right now. Thank you for preparing me, Lord. Thank you for preparing me, Lord. And when you call us to the great opportunity, if my mind wants to go someplace else, Lord, correct it. Get, get, get me back in line. And give me the strength. Pour in me your power and your hope and your assurance so that I can step out. You know how hard it is, Lord, for me to take that first step. You know, give, give me the Peter moment. Just, just, help me to, just help me to step out on that water. I, you know, everything in my mind is telling me, yeah, but that's water, and you're on a fish. But Lord, help me to step out on that water and know that you have the ability to gird it up and walk me where I need to go. This is your journey. This is your victory. Help me to walk where I need to walk, Lord, to have impact on your people for Christ. Father God, thank you for blessing us today to just spend this time together as family. In this small piece of your holy word, Lord, thank you for the insights you've given us. Now, as we, as we, as we attempt to apply it to our lives, give us the wisdom and the strength to apply your teachings to our lives and walk in your heart and in your hand and share this good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to be faithful. Help our unbelief, Father God. We, we need you now. Take us from that mindset of lack to the, to the mindset of abundance and even leftovers. In Jesus' holy name, we praise you and we give you glory and we thank you, Lord. Can somebody in the house other than me just say amen, amen. and amen? God bless your family. God bless your family. We're going to stand together as, a, as a, our new members, directors. Ladies, come down. We open up the doors of the church. This is, this is a moment. You get to say, come, welcome home if you're looking for a church family. Welcome home if you're looking for a fresh new start. Let us hope as we open up our arms to you. And extend our love towards you and invite you to come and become a part of the Trinity family. The doors of the church are open right now today. And we invite you to come. All the way.
be prepared now to close out with our benediction. March out lovingly and boldly out into this marketplace for ministry known as the world. Praising God and thanking him for who he is, the opportunities he provides for us, all that he gives us, all that he means to us. Looking for, being cognizant of, being intentional about the opportunity to share this good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ with any and everyone the Lord prompts us sends across our path. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, hearts humbled before the living God, assuming an attitude of prayer, lifting our hands to him in praise. Now unto him who is able to keep you and me from falling, and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now, henceforth, and forevermore, let all God's people say amen. amen.